Hello, and welcome to Law Talk. My name is John Celebrezzi, and I'm the co-founder of the Celebrezzi Zangi Community Legal Education Project, as we call it, CZ CLEP for short. Our organization provides continuing education about the judiciary and legislature to attorneys, judges, government officials, and the general public. As a career ed educator, I recognize early on how important legal matters are and, and how they impact our lives. I am the nephew of the late Anthony J. Celebrezzi, who was the popular five-term mayor of Cleveland and a member of President Kennedy's cabinets. As a tribute to his lifetime commitment to the legal process, we dedicate this show. Today's guest is the winner of the Anthony J. Celebrezzi Appellate Advocacy Competition. Jacqueline Dupert is from Greentown, Indiana. She graduated with a BS in Biology from Manchester College. A little known fact about Jacqueline is that she went to college on an opera scholarship. She has performed at Carnegie Hall. Jacqueline also enjoys playing tennis, the piano. She plans to specialize in intellectual property law after graduation. Jackie, welcome to Law Talk. Thank you for having me. Well, it's our pleasure to have you, and of course this is always a show that we uh, tape with great pride because the competition that you won, the Celebrezzi Moot Court Competition, as you know, is named in honor of my Uncle Tony, who we, we dedicate uh, everything at CZ, CZ Clip to. So you're our very, very special guest. You are actually the third law student in as many years that have sat in that chair. Uh, two of your other Ohio Northern uh, predecessors who won the competition have visited with, with us as well and we try to make it an annual tradition to invite the, uh, the winner of the competition. Um, I have a lot of questions for you about the competition. Of course I have some about the case itself which mm -hmm. interestingly enough was decided this week. Yes. Right? How about yes. that? Uh, but before we dig into United States versus Arizona Let's talk about Ohio Northern and you know what is the appellant advocacy competition that is that you have participated at your law school, Ohio Northern. Well, the Celebrezzi competition is in fact our most prestigious uh, interschool competition. We have three interschool competitions, meaning that only Ohio Northern students are eligible to compete in them. I see. And this is the most prestigious, and it is of course named after Judge uh, Celebrezzi. And it's a wonderful opportunity because it allows us to honor his legacy while also helping students improve their oral advocacy and public speaking skills through this competition setting. I see. Actually, in your case, albeit I'm sure you're an excellent law student and you have now completed two years, right? Yes. So you have one more to go. Yes. But as far as your public speaking ability and whatnot, it's my understanding prior to law school, you have done something that's kind of unique. You actually performed at Carnegie Hall. Yes, I did. I was able to perform there. Uh, in 2006, I actually did two concerts. I did a prelude concert, and then the second concert, we were uh, debuting a new, uh, new piece of music. So it was a wonderful opportunity. I see. So you're an opera singer? Yes. Wow. <laughs> that makes kind you of a unique, pretty unique guest here. You, you, you won my uncle's competition, and you're also an opera singer. So. Uh, Congratulations on, on both. Thank you, you very well, much. Job well done. To win, and I, I, I saw you, I was there on April 4, 2012, you had to prevail throughout a series of rounds. How many, Jackie, all together? Well, there's actually four rounds, and the first round is the most important because you actually go twice. So the way that it works is members of the moot court board will judge the first round where every individual competing will get to go twice, meaning okay. that every single person gets to have the experience to argue uh, petitioner and respondent in the case. Then after that, they begin to narrow down the field and they will have professors judge the second and third round. Uh, this year, because it was in fact an immigration issue, we were lucky to have Professor Thaxton, who's the immigration professor, judge the semifinal round. Now the final round is open to the public. And we like to have a very prestigious panel of either appeals court or federal judges. And this year we actually were very lucky. We had Judge Bryant, Judge Carr, and Judge Willimowski yeah. able to attend that final competition and judge yes. the final round. Yeah, yeah, all, 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 all appellant judges. Yes, right? yeah. yes. Yeah. Okay. So when I saw you, I actually witnessed you win on April 4, mm -hmm. 
give my my viewers an idea of when you get started on this because I mean this thing takes up a good bit of time doesn't it it actually it, it does it's a it's a very complex process because you have to read the briefs for both sides because you will in fact be arguing both sides of the case yeah so you have to know both briefs you have to know all the cases that both briefs cite and then you have to begin crafting your arguments in my case this was during the middle of moot court season i was also on the aba's national appellate advocacy uh, team so we had just had our regional competition in washington dc and I came back, we had won that. So I had two weeks to prepare for Celebrezzi, and then I immediately had to go off to the national competition in Chicago. Yeah. So it was, uh, it was a very busy time, yeah. but of course, well worth it. And it's, uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you view it as fun, and I'm, I'm glad you won. To, to put this kind of in perspective, though, uh, victory was yours on April 4, but you mentioned the, the two rounds, the moot court Yes. your peers yes. as well as the professors mm -hmm. when did that take place what when what months did did those competition or did well that did would that would have been in late march so okay. what happened is we actually do it on a weekend the first round because you'll argue uh, either petitioner responded on saturday and then the other uh, side on sunday okay so we that it's a it's a weekend commitment and then they'll have the third round on a wednesday and then they'll have the fourth round on the next monday and then the final round will be the next Wednesday. It's pretty rapid fire then, though. Yes. It's, it's, it's it pretty compressed once, at that point in time. Once you're in the competition, it becomes uh, very uh, stressful. Sure, and, sure. Uh, I, I, I can imagine. Yes. Uh, <laughs> in that chair, we've had very interesting guests on Law Talk. You might find this interesting. Last, our last show, we had Justice uh, McGee Brown of the Ohio Supreme Court, mm -hmm. who I believe actually uh, addressed your law school at this year's con commencement. Yeah. And I mentioned to her, by the way, that you, that you would be here representing law school this week. This week. Mm -hmm. uh, all lawyers, judges, and we've had various judges at the appellant level on common pleas. Um, this is what our, what our show is about. But I guess the point I'm trying to make, whatever you do in a court, for every hour you're in a court, and an hour is a long time to be in a court. Mm -hmm. There are hours and hours and hours of preparation. So Absolutely. I imagine you start taking a look at those briefs going back to Christmas? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, the Celebrezzi problem was announced uh, right after we got back and began our semester in February. Right, right. Okay. And you, you need to start looking at the briefs right away uh, because sure. you, you will have to know the law well enough that you can argue in front of appeals judges, you know, a week after you begin the competition. Sure. Uh, the chief of police of the city of Finley, many years ago, was, I was chatting with him, and we're talking about preparation to be a police officer, and something he told me always stuck with me, that when, when they try out with their, or they have to qualify with their, their handgun, mm -hmm. they have to do it with both hands. I yes. mean, you know, I, I find it difficult to shoot with one hand, no less both hands. But I think there's an analogy here because what you said earlier, you had to actually be on both sides of this case, didn't you? Yes. And you had to be as convincing on both sides of this case. You do. Interestingly enough, you won it on the government side, right? Yes, I did. Okay, so you were the respondent or the petitioner? I was the respondent. Okay, so the state of Arizona was the petitioner. Yes. You were responding as the United States government, the lawyer for the United States government. However, at some point in time, you were Arizona's lawyer too. Yes. Okay. I right. actually, I argued both sides of the case at least twice throughout the competition. Well, I guess the good news on that for any preparation you do as a lawyer throughout your hopefully long and successful career doesn't hurt to see it from the other side. Yes. Okay, I mean, to, to be an effect. On the other hand, um, just like shooting that gun with your other hand, mm -hmm. I imagine that'd be kind of difficult. I mean, I, 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 I could... Uh, I always make a point at this show of telling our readers that you have you have to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting, this week, I mean, our, our timing couldn't have been any better, even though I can't take credit for when the Supreme Court rules on something, but your case has been decided, right? Yes. Okay. And who won? My side that I argued in the final round actually won. Uh, the United States of America won. Um, on every provision except for 2B, and we can talk about that later, yeah, we'll but that was extremely limited, so. Wow. Yes. So not only does she win the competition, <laughs> she wins the case. I mean, 
you have a bright bright future in front of you, young lady. Thank okay. you. Uh, they don't always come down this way, but this time they did. Uh, well, let's talk about the case a little bit. Uh, really kind of interesting case. Uh, this year's problem dealt with, it was called Arizona versus the United States. And the issue was uh, what rights can the state extend or deny to its citizens? Okay, so Jackie, I'll let you tell my viewers in your own words what this means. Well, it's, a, it's an issue of field preemption. Uh, Congress, through the Constitution, is allowed to enact a uniform rule of naturalization, which uh, Congress does through the okay. INA. However, Arizona is facing some unique problems with illegal immigration. Right. So the state of Arizona developed SB 1070 as a way that they could combat some of those problems. Of that bill, four provisions uh, were deemed to be unconstitutional by the Ninth Circuit. And that case eventually went to the Supreme Court. And it's an issue of field preemption because the first issue is if the INA uh, fully occupies the field of immigration to where the state of Arizona cannot enact any additional laws. Then once you get past that, there's an issue of parallel enforcement, where even if the INA does represent uh, the entire field of immigration law, can the state of Arizona enforce it in, in a way that's parallel, but it just represents the way that Arizona is choosing to enforce that I law. I see. Okay. All right, so the issue is from the government's point of view, Congress, yes. the United States of America, preemption. We we, Congress, if I'm mm -hmm. speaking for Congress, trump the states. Yes. Okay, so that's kind of what this case was about. And as you were arguing, when I saw you win, that's mm -hmm. what the point you were making to the appellant judges. Yes. The, the preemption issue is here, judges, and United States law is gonna, going to trump Arizona law. Mm -hmm. All right, now, so I think rested, you but but we should go back just a bit more, and then we'll, we'll pick it apart a little bit. But this is a landmark case. Yes, and absolutely. And what you said about Arizona and its challenges of, of illegal immigrants, I read somewhere, I mean, I, I, I probably read it in the newspaper, but countrywide, the United, United States of America, they threw out the figure of 11 million illegals mm -hmm. in this country. Okay. Yes. I'm not trying to make an issue of it other than, you know, whether I'm for it or against it, but my point is this is a huge problem that we're having here. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the question is, you know, who's going to deal with it? The United States, the United States or, or the states or together, which, yeah. you know, you, you, you have brought. Okay, so now that you know, I mean, I, I was kidding you about your side winning, of course, but, yes. but now that you know uh, how it came out, mm -hmm. I mean, which we didn't know on April uh, 4th. Yeah. What do you think the significance of this case is? Well, I think that it's very significant because the courts clarified its position on preemption and parallel enforcement. Uh, one of the interesting points about this case is in the previous term, the Supreme Court had heard the Whiting case. And in the Whiting case, the Supreme Court had allowed the state of Arizona to go beyond the INA in the issuing of business licenses. So that sort of opened up the door to where states were wondering, does the INA fully occupy the field of immigration? I see. And that's what this case was in fact answering. So this is really significant. Yes, very significant. And the court held that the INA does, in fact, occupy the field of immigration. Okay, I, I wasn't familiar with that one, but you say the other one, Jackie, the other case was the Whiting case? Yes. And there it was leaning, the, the court was leaning more towards favoring the states as far as business activity? Yes, but it's very, it's very uh, kind of technical uh, issue. Uh, states are considered uh, kind of like many sovereigns in the United States sure. and they have certain rights and the ability to issue a business license was considered part of the sovereign uh, rights that the state of Arizona has. The okay. state has the ability to regulate business within sure, that state. Sure. However, the state of Arizona in the SB 1070 was attempting to make it a crime to be illegal in the state of Arizona. And to be illegal in the United States is an offense against the United States of America, not an offense against any particular state. So the state was attempting, to, was attempting to broaden their rights by making it a state crime to be illegal in the state of Arizona. So there's your distinction right yes. there. Yes, and it was very interesting because the Supreme Court used a, a very small but very interesting line of cases, uh, such as Buckman and Ray Looney, that states that if a crime is a federal offense only against the United States government, the state does not have the right to parallelly enforce that 
law, only if it's an offense against the state, not if it's an offense against the federal government. I see. Yes. So truly a significant case. Now, Very significant. as you throw out these names, and you know, those of us in the legal profession, this is how we talk when we're arguing before yes. judges, of course, at least at the appellant level. But for the purposes of my viewers who are not attorneys, absolutely, this whole thing turns on a concept, I th a Latin term called stare decisis. Yes. Uh, in your own words, would you tell them what that means, or? Well, what it means is that what's been decided before should be decided again I because see. people rely on the law. And if there's been a decision or a decree uh, from the from a, a law or a previous case, people begin relying on that and people begin acting on that as if it were the law. And it would be inappropriate if every single time the Supreme Court met, if they changed that and changed the rules and changed the way that things uh, operate. So they tend to attempt to follow their previous rulings unless the law or circumstances have changed in some way where they feel it's at this point appropriate to completely change their opinion. So as you throw out these cases, and, and both you and your uh, opponent were did a fine, fine job of using cases that would support your your side, of course. And is an outstanding advocate, too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, no doubt about it. By the time you <laughs> two got to this point, I mean, it's uh, as the judges said, it's, it's, it's always a very, very difficult decision. Mm -hmm. And I think I told you earlier, I could remember when my uncle actually was there making that award. He told me the same thing. I mean, yeah. I mean it was it, the whole thing was uh, the, the competition I is in his honor, and mm -hmm. he attended that law school many, many years ago. And he would tell me personally, this is one of the more difficult things I have to do. So. There was no losers in this thing. I mean, he, both of you did a fine, fine job. But I guess my point is, on, on picking the cases for purpose of argument mm -hmm. to be persuasive, but actually, when you explain stare decisis, I think you did an excellent job there. It's not exactly willy-nilly that we change from left to right and right to left. It's yes. more like nuances that yes. you know we went from the sovereign activity of businesses to powers of arrest and criminal act there so yes. it's a refining thing so that's why the law i guess is never stagnant it's always it's changing always changing just a yeah. little bit just slightly we had uh, uh justice mckee brown as i mentioned here earlier and and i had her i asked her if she would explain the concept of a minority opinion because sometimes we get into this winner takes all mm -hmm. and she said of course this is what the state supreme court but sometimes when they are deciding a case there, uh, one of the justices who have, who have been on the point says, yeah, as a matter of fact, I wrote a minority opinion on a very same thing mm -hmm. five years ago and things, the nuances have brought it around to now the minority becomes the majority. So I Absolutely. guess that's the way the system works. Uh, and it is a good system. Um, okay, well, the case is the case. There was one, one last thing about it. Uh, apparently, this, this survived, Jackie. In Arizona, and there's the border there, obviously, and uh, this is perceived a real issue of the number of people crossing that border, some illegally, obviously, mm -hmm. of what do the authorities in the state of uh, Arizona did and do, and of course that what their law says, well, we're going to arrest them and do something with them. They can't do that now. But apparently there was a provision in there that, that survived. It was called, show me your papers. Mm -hmm. Do you know what that means? Yes, Section 2B is one of the more controversial provisions. Um, it, it has several aspects. One is once a person has been detained, the officer has the right to determine their uh, immigration status before they're released. Um, another is that anybody who's suspected of being uh, in the country legally must prove, uh, provide documentation or papers that they're not. So actually, all right, so this is what you said before about parallel enforcement. Yes. So. Arizona is permitted, the cop is permitted to say, show me your papers, and you detain somebody. But that doesn't necessarily mean that an Ohio officer has that same power. Is that correct? Uh, precisely, because SB 1070, of course, uh, only affects Arizona law. Sure. But even uh, Section 2B, it was not overturned, but the Supreme Court limited it. And the way that they did that is this came to the Supreme Court on a preliminary injunction because as soon as the law was passed, it was enjoined. Right. And so there really hadn't been any harm. 
So the Supreme Court was going to overturn this provision simply because it could be implemented in an unconstitutional way. There was no evidence that it would, in fact, be implemented in an unconstitutional way. And in fact, there were provisions within the bill stating that they had to comply with various regulations sure. and all of that. So the Supreme Court said, that's fine, we're not going to overturn it right now. But what we're going to do is keep a close eye on the way that it is, in fact, enforced. I see. And if it turns out that Section 2B is going to be enforced in a way that's unconstitutional or uh, deals with racial profiling or discrimination based on national origin and some of these other issues that could potentially but have not yet happened, then the Supreme Court opened the door to where they could review that Section 2B again and uh, overturn that as well if it needs to be. I see. There's a, there's a, cl there's a class you, you take in law school, there's got to be, that deals with what we just talked about. What is it? That would be con law. It's actually a second year course. Constitutional law? Yes. Okay. Uh, as I remember that, of course, I guess all law schools are different. I think I had to have two semesters of it. Yes. It's the same thing? So I had two semesters. Actually, the way they do it now is the first semester is required, the second semester is optional, but they really encourage you to take mm -hmm. the second semester. Okay. And I, I, the second part of my question, I think I did ask you myself, why is it important to attorneys? It's important to attorneys to mm -hmm. understand that framework yes. and you go from there, which you obviously do well, a good job. And go it's very interesting in a case like this because you learn that the actual legal points that are being argued are extremely different from the social or political implications of the law. In this case, we're dealing with, uh, you know, the sovereign right of the state of Arizona to make a uh, federal offense a state offense and field preemption. We weren't actually dealing with racial profiling issues and some of the more political right. issues <coughs> that were associated with that. And you have to study constitutional law to really understand the nuances of the law itself and not get caught up in the politics sure. of the law. Yeah, and, and this idea of racial profiling, is that's what yes. uh, the civil, American Civil Liberties Union has. Have, they've, even, they've even brought it up after the decision has been made about, yes. you know, show me your papers. Mm -hmm. And, and a, a fair point to bring up, a very emotional Absolutely. point. Yes. But we get to where we're going by understanding how our Constitution works Yes. And that's why you took constitutional. You, you, you've completed both now? Both semesters, Okay, well, yes. you've got those under your belt. That's <laughs> great. Uh, okay, let's shift back to the competition here. Of all the ones you threw, and it's, it sounds to me like you rather enjoyed this to, you know, I'm sure you wouldn't have done it if there wasn't some satisfaction. But nonetheless, mm -hmm. uh, law school is a time when time is, is really of the essence and to it find is, the time. Yes. Uh, some people get pretty stressed out about all the things that you have to do in a short period of time. So to find some enjoyment out of this, good for you. Uh, what was the most difficult part, though? I mean, uh, looking back on it, what was your probably the most difficult part of, you know, leading up to uh, April 4 when you won? Well, absolutely, switching sides. That's very difficult, as we stated earlier. You have to understand both sides of the case as well as you understand the side that you're currently arguing. I see. And that does open up the door to where you understand the law so much better once you understand all the arguments for and against the petitioner, and then you can turn around and understand all the arguments for and against respondent. You really get a, a deep understanding of the case. Um, a, another thing that can be difficult is that you're doing this at the same time you're also keeping up with your schoolwork and right. your studies. Right. So it, it is something that is a, a time commitment, but you get so much out of it because it really does help sharpen your oral, oral advocacy skills. And hopefully we all someday want to be attorneys and go oh, into sure. the courtroom and have clients and we want to represent them to the best of our ability and we're building these skills now through competitions like this. Yeah, yeah and, and I, I guess that was my next question. How will, how will this help you? And it will help you by the pressures of, or dealing with the pressures of keeping a lot of balls in the air. Your studies had to be done. You, you, yes. you, I'm sure it w there had to be one of my favorite professors from ONU that called on you and said, Ms. Daubert, and you had to stand, and mm -hmm. uh, I'd like the facts of this case. I don't think it would work to say, well, you know, Professor, I've been preparing for the Celebrezzi Moot Court. I don't think that would have worked. No, uh, and it, it always happens that you get called on the day of the competition. Mm -hmm. So it's always the day of the competition when you, you have all these irrelevant cases running through your mind, and that's when you hear, <laughs> Ms. Daubert, could you please tell us about today's reading? So then you have to stand up and switch sure. gears. For the benefit of our, of our, our viewers, this is the, Socr uh, the Socratic me method 
uh, all law students deal with it. You're called mm -hmm. upon, you must think on your feet, as, yes. as the judges did to you. I mean, they, they stopped you, I saw them stop you numerous times, mm -hmm. and your, 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 your competitor, yes. uh, and made you explain a point of law without breaking your cadence and losing the whole thing. Uh, so, I mean, I think that's, Socrates had a pretty good idea there. Uh, law students still lament it to, to some degree. If you're not yes. prepared, uh, when he calls on you, you, you're sort of in a world of hurt because there's nothing you can do. You, you can't fake it. You I can't mean, fake it. It's, uh, it won't happen. Okay, let's, a uh, little time we got left here. Actually, there are very small number of law students who participate in these types of competition uh, because you did and you won. Uh, what do you, what do you think the experience will, how it will help you as a prospective attorney? I think you've answered that, uh, probably dealing with the pressure of it, but actually, well, don't let me put words in your mouth, but even the the currency of what you did. Yes. I mean, around our law office today, we were all waiting for the decision on on the health care. I was. That's what I was doing in my uh, hotel room this morning. I was. I was sitting there waiting for the case to come out. So, I mean, that's new law. New law. And yes, affects, very interesting. Affects us all. Yes. Uh, one thing about being a lawyer, it always changes, and, and you yep. won't be a very effective lawyer if if you don't keep keep current about what's going on. Uh, what motivated you to participate in this competition? Well, I have a strong interest in litigation and I've always loved uh, moot court or mock trial or experiences like that because I understand that they really do help make you a better advocate. Sure. You, you learn lots of skills. Um, y you'll create your argument and you think that you have that winning point and you'll get in there and 30 seconds into your argument, a judge will just say, I don't find this argument persuasive. You still have 20 minutes yep. to convince me that you win and mm -hmm. you have to think on your feet mm -hmm. and make that happen. And so it really does prepare you for the real world where anything can be thrown at you and you have to represent your client. No, well, I guess that's, that's a good point. Well, your second year, I mean, you'll be back to school in the fall. Yes. W will you do it again? Well, actually, I'm the current Chief Justice of ONU's Moot Court Program. I was recently elected to that position, meaning that I'll be ineligible to argue um, in the Celebrezzi competition again. However, I will, in fact, have the honor of setting it up. Oh, so while okay. I won't get to argue, I will get to ensure that students get the benefit of the competition sure. and get to practice next year. Well, that's great, Jackie. Well, thank you so much for being our guest on Law Talk. Thank you very and much. And we wish you the very best of luck. Thank you. Comments made by John's guest on Law Talk are solely those of his guests and do not necessarily reflect the views of Celebrezzi Zangi Community Legal Education Project. To view this show and others, go to www.cdzclub.org. In the Wandsworth area, a complete listing of dates and times of this broadcast, tune in to WCTV Channel 15, or log on to wandsworthcity.com and follow the links to WCTV. At CZ Clip, we're devoted to the education of today's legal issues. Fueled by the public's keen interest in our legal system and current events, CZ Clip is dedicated to the educational venues aimed at enhancing the understanding by all citizens, regardless of age, education, occupation, or wealth. A function of the Celebrezzi Zangi Community Legal Education Project.